we've been uh, learning about church, understanding what God wants for his church, and understanding uh, last week what Jesus prayed for in regards to his church as far as us being unified. So we have uh, set the foundation for church and for the, the purpose of us meeting together and why it's so important. Uh, we have also laid the groundwork for uh, the Bible and understanding the Bible as the Word of God and uh, the authority that it has. And we've also learned about how we are to interpret and how we can uh, get a understanding of the things that the Bible communicates. And so uh, that being said, today we are going to be introducing the concept of God. Right? So this church. We are here to learn about God. Uh, so we are going to learn about God starting today uh, and for the next uh, several weeks up until pretty much right after Thanksgiving, pretty much through November, we're going to be looking at uh, the person of God, the, the character of God. So today we're going to be breaking down uh, the Trinity. So you're going to have to bear with me because there's a lot to, to unpack in that. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the Trinity, and then uh, for the rest of November, we are going to be looking at the, the three different parts of the Trinity. So we're going to be looking at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and uh, looking at those characteristics and what makes them different from one another in the role that they play in the lives of believers. So that is going to be kind of what November uh, is going to look like for us. But... Now that Clay has made the announcement about us working at the church and, you know, your board feel free to stick around, now I have to make this film boring uh, so that you guys feel the need to stick around. I'm just going to try to make this as light as we can possibly. Um, but that being said, this can be a little dry. I'll admit, like, this kind of information, it can be a little dry. So, to spice things up, I have a nice little video uh, for us to watch. This is put together by a YouTube channel called uh, Lutheran Satire. They're, they have a couple of friends who are going to help me break down uh, the concept of the Trinity. Their names are Donald and Connell. Uh, they are a couple of uh, middle age, not, I don't mean middle ages in like, they're like in their 40s. I mean middle ages in like from the 1400s, maybe earlier. Uh, they're some Irish folk. Some, some just old Irish folk who are trying to get a better understanding of the Trinity and of God and questions about God. And so, uh, without further ado, please feel free to tune in to this amazing video that I hope you find as humorous and educational as I do, which has been viewed by 1.7 million people. And apparently, a lot of Bible colleges, not just mine, are starting to use this to teach theology. So, that's the world we live in nowadays. We watch cartoon YouTube videos to learn about God. Yeah. Welcome to 2022. fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So we're trying to keep it simple. Okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like... Uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms, liquid, and ice, and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noavis and Sibelius, which establishes that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star, and the light, and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick! That's Arianism, Patrick! Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. There's a word, Patrick. All right, sorry. 
Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism. A heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partial? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously. I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, it was a program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. <laughs> oh, my God. Alright, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Mortalism again! Alright, then it's like the three layers of an animal. Partialism, revisit it. Fine. Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, I thought you were the bush, Patrick. Now I thought a bunch of giant green foam hats get riotously drunk and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. <laughs>
but they don't necessarily know why they believe it. And I believe that uh, the Trinity and some of the different aspects of the Trinity, Trinity are one of those things. And so when somebody comes forward, uh, you know, somebody who has decided to maybe break down their, their own faith, they've decided to walk away, or maybe they are proponents of another faith, uh, like Islam, and when these people are confronted with these different things and these different arguments, oftentimes we just don't know how to handle that. So when somebody comes up to you and they say, well, I don't know why you believe in the Trinity, that word never shows up in the Bible. That is true. That, that is true. Like, I can't be like, okay, open your Bible to John chapter 14 and whatever book, and, and Jesus is going to say that the Trinity exists. And he's going to use that word specifically. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. So I will willingly admit that. However, because we have already looked at how we break down scripture, and because we have already looked at how we uh, pull the meaning out of text, we can come to the inference that the Trinity may not be specifically stated in the Bible, but we can believe without a doubt that God exists in three different persons. We're going to do that by looking at a few passages that are going to show us how God is existing in those three different persons. The first one is this, Colossians chapter 2. Uh, verse 19 10. If you have your Bible, feel free to turn with me there. Uh, it will be on the screen, so feel free to follow along. It says this. This is what, what Paul is writing. For the en entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. So here we have uh, Paul who is Speaking to the Colossians, and one of the things that he says is that the entire fullness of God's nature, so everything about who God is, is embodied in Christ. It dwells in the body of Christ. So Jesus himself takes the entire nature of everything that is God and puts it in a bodily form. Now that, that body is Jesus Christ. So now we have Jesus existing as God that is stated here. And so one of the arguments uh, that often get thrown out about Jesus, uh, huge proponents of, of Islam, uh, those who are Muslim, oftentimes what they say is that Jesus is not God. So what, most likely what they're going to argue is that uh, they believe that Christianity is not monotheistic. They believe that, that Christianity does not have one God. They believe that Christians identify Jesus as a God, God the Father as a God, and the Holy Spirit as a God. And so that's where this whole idea of the Trinity really starts to make a huge difference in how we uh, understand our own faith, but also how we communicate our own faith. So that when we have conversations with people who do not view things the same way, and they say, well, you as a Christian, you're not, you don't believe in one God, you believe in three. No, 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 we don't believe in three gods, we believe in one God who is present in three different persons, and one of those persons is Jesus. And so, oftentimes, the argument is, well, Jesus never claimed that he was God. Jesus, he never said he was God. And so... As we'll, we'll, we'll kind of deal with this here in a little bit. Uh, we are going to find that that is just not exactly true. Is, is there a verse where Jesus said, hey guys, I am God? No. Like, Jesus didn't come right out and say, I am God. That didn't happen. We are, however, going to see a passage where Jesus does show his audience that they that he is claiming to be God, and on top of that, we're going to see their response, which is only suitable for those who claim to be God. And so we're going to deal with that here in a second. But before we get to that part, I want us to look at Acts chapter 5. So Acts 
Acts chapter 5, uh, what's kind of going on in Acts chapter 5 is the church has started, people are bringing uh, their belongings together, they're selling what they have, they're trying to give to the church, they're trying to benefit those in their community and, and things like that. Now, what happens in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, there's a man and his wife. Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. Now, they see somebody else. They see uh, Barnabas get this huge blessing. Everybody loves Barnabas now because he <laughs> sold all he had and gave all of it to the church. So everybody's like, wow, Barnabas is so cool. Like, look at what he did for us. So Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they devised this plot to try to get some of that glory. They try to sell everything that they have and they give a portion to the church, but they say that they have given everything that they made off of this sale to the church. And Peter gives this response. This is Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 3 and 4. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Now, here we, we have Peter, he says, why did you take it upon yourself to lie to the Holy Spirit? Right, so he's showing you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 4, we're going to see what he equates that to. Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to people, but to God. So, in verse 3, Peter says, You have taken it upon yourself to lie to the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, he indicates, You have lied not to mere men, but to God. So, why does that comparison exist if the Holy Spirit is not God? And vice versa. Now, as Peter is saying this, he has been spurred on to say this by the Spirit. God's Spirit has led Peter to uh, recognize this lie. This is not like Peter went and like launched some kind of full-scale investigation. He didn't hire like the local FBI to go in and like raid Ananias and Sapphira and like find all of their receipts and find where the money was. That's not what happened. As soon as Ananias and Sapphira, when they bring the money, Peter knows on the spot through the Spirit that they have lied because they lied to the Spirit. And Peter says, you have lied to God. So here we have Jesus in Colossians being compared to God that Jesus is the full embodiment of God. All of God's nature dwells in the, the body of Christ. He is God. God is Him. And in Acts chapter 5, we have that the Holy Spirit is being lied to, but not just the Holy Spirit. God is being lied to. So now we have Jesus being acquainted with God, and we have the Holy Spirit being acquainted with God. And I didn't really bother to break down the Father being God, like, there's virtually nobody in Christianity who believes that, you know, the Father is not God. Like, that's pretty evident. We kind of covered that last week as we talked about Jesus' prayer. He's praying to God the Father and trying to establish God as the Father. So uh, we do not really need to wrestle too much with the Father as being God. That's not – oftentimes that's not what's debated, and that's not the, the point that people try to argue with, that we believe that the Father is God. Oftentimes it, it lies more with the Holy Spirit and Jesus and their deity. And so that's kind of why we decided to go there. So there's three uh, truths that I want to kind of pull out from here. And it's this. And we can go ahead and put that first one up. Though the word Trinity is not in the Bible, we see it very clearly implied through the divinity of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So when we look at the Bible, when we look at what it teaches about Jesus, and when we look at what it teaches about the Holy Spirit, we understand that they are divine. That God's nature 
is present in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit and in the Father. No, we didn't really deal with that a whole lot. Which that's my bad. Maybe I could have thrown that in there and stuck it in a little differently, but I didn't. So we're gonna move. Um, we see God's divinity present in the Son and the Spirit. And to kind of fully lay that out there, in John chapter 1, we see that the Word becomes flesh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what we see in John chapter 1. Uh, Jesus is being referred to as the Word, and it is said that he was with God in the beginning and is God. And well, so some people will say, oh, well, that's not actually Jesus saying that he was God. He said, we'll get there. We'll get there, I promise. For those who say that Jesus never claimed to be God, I'm going to give you some, some fuel to that fire and give you a little, a little fight back, a little ammunition. The second is this. The second truth is this. The concept of the Trinity was originally started to oppose heresy in the church. <laughs> Now, I should lay this out there. The Trinity is not some concept that was just like made up on the spot. As we've looked and as we've kind of dealt with it, we have seen the Trinity start to take shape and take form in the Bible. And when we look at how Jesus, uh, the, the command that Jesus gives to his disciples to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we see those three persons of the Godhead starting to come together in our theology. So when we look at how Jesus asks us to baptize people, we are being asked to baptize in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We are not being told to baptize them in the name of three different gods. That's not what happens. Now, there's you know, Donald and Connell, they, they spoke kind of fast. They spoke kind of quick, and I get that. They were dealing with a couple of heresies, and they kind of poke fun at, uh, at St. Patrick because some of the things and some of the analogies he was using to his faith, you know, he said some heresies that were taught. One of them is modalism. Uh, one of them is modalism that essentially it started, and this is not new. This is not new. <laughs> and I, I want to tell you, the reason that we're talking about the idea of the Trinity, this still exists today. I want to make that very well known. You might not know anybody who like believes this. Maybe they've just not told you they believe this. This is an idea that is still believed today. There's an entire denomination known as Oneness Pentecostalism uh, that that is one of their beliefs. That they do not believe in the idea of a triune uh, trinity. They do not believe in a triune God. They believe in modalism. And the idea of modalism is that God does not exist in three distinct different persons all at the same time. That's the key. That's going to be the key difference. You see, we believe in, 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 the, in the belief of the Trinity. What we believe is that God exists all the time in these three distinct persons. That's what we believe. So God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three exist all the time. Eternally. There is never a time where one of those three does not exist. That is not what modalism teaches. Modalism teaches that God exists and he manifests himself in three different ways. So God is either the Father, God is either the Son, or God is either the Holy Spirit. So the way that this kind of looks, in the Old Testament, God was always the Father, because Jesus didn't exist yet. So then when Jesus comes into play, God exists in the Son. So now when Jesus ascends and goes into heaven, God exists in the Holy Spirit. They don't all three exist in the, at the same time. That, I want to make, I'm not saying that. That's what modalism teaches. Trinity, and the word Trinitarian, uh, that view is that all three exist. So we believe in the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit has been sent to believers in order to regenerate, in order, in order, in order to guide us 
as we walk through this Christian life. That doesn't mean that God the Father and Jesus stopped existing because God now exists in the Holy Spirit. That's not what we believe. There are people who do believe that. And I'm not talking about way back in the day, uh, you know, in like the early start of the church in the 200s. I'm not talking about then. I'm talking about now. There are people who believe that God only exists at certain times as certain people. That is not what we believe. And so now I'm hoping that maybe I've clearly communicated well enough that that's just not true. All three are God. All three exist eternally, and we see that in the Word of God. When we approach verses like in, in passages like John chapter 1, where the Father was with the Word, we see that both persons of the Trinity exist right then and there. And in Genesis chapter 1, we see that the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters. We see that all three uh, aspects of the Trinity are living together in harmony. They are all together eternally. They are not happening one at a time. The last point is sort of like a, a little challenge, and it's this. Let me go ahead and set up. Having an understanding of the Trinity today is important because that leads to the faith of faith. It is important that we can defend our faith. Uh, the first, in, in First Peter, the, the first letter that Peter writes, one of the things that he he says is that we as Christians should always be able to give an account of the things that we believe. We should always be able to uh, give an account, to give a defense of what we believe. And so, when people come to us and they say, "Well, the Bible says this," we can say, "No, no, no, no. That's a misunderstanding." The Bible never says Trinity. The Bible doesn't say that there's a Trinity. How can you believe there's a Trinity? Well, when I look at the Bible and I see that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all divine, and when I see that we're called to <laughs> baptize people in the name of Him, I see that there is a Trinity there. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Right? Other people claim that Jesus is God. Right? Richard, you said Colossians says. You said that, that Paul said that Jesus is God. But Jesus doesn't claim to be God. And my response to that would be John chapter 8. So in John chapter 8, uh, there's been a, a, a slight series of attacks against Jesus from uh, the religious people of, of his day. Uh, prior, pretty much right up to this point, uh, the woman was caught in adultery. That whole aspect happens, that, that scene plays out where they try to trap Jesus. And here, the, the Jews are having a conversation with, with Jesus. And here's kind of what goes on. John chapter 8, verse 48 through 59. Let me go ahead and set up. The Jews responded to him, Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? It's a pretty, pretty rough conclusion. I don't know. Like, that came out of nowhere. I do not have a demon, Jesus answered. On the contrary, I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is no one who seeks it and judges. Truly I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Then the Jews said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. You say if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets who died? Who do you claim? Right here, the 
the Jew, from his question to Jesus. Who is it that you are claiming to be? You say that those who listen to your word will never taste death, but even our fathers and the prophets, they died. So who is it that you are claiming to be? And this is his response. If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father about whom you say, he is our God, he is the one who glorified me. You do not know him, but I, but I know him. If I were to say, I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews replied, you aren't 50 years old yet. And you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. was, before Abraham was, I am, which that I am statement is the one that God uses in the Old Testament. So when, when Jesus says, I am, and they just ask you, and they've asked him, who do you claim to be? That seems pretty clear cut. And if that answer doesn't <laughs> seem clear cut enough, and while some people might say, well, he still never claimed he was God, the Jews would is to stone him to death because of blasphemy. That's why they pick up stones and want to kill him. Because in their minds and from the words they just heard, he has blasphemed by claiming to be God. That was a sin punishable by stoning. So don't tell me Jesus never claimed to be God. He says, that before Abraham was, I am, and their response is to stone him as a blasphemer. So when somebody from Islam or somebody who says that Jesus is not God and never claimed to be God, when they come to you and they say, Jesus never said this, we have a response. Uh, yes, he did. Jesus made it known that he was God. And because of the work of the Trinity, because of God existing in three different persons, we can trust his Holy Spirit to work on the lives of the other authors who wrote the books of the Bible. And because we've already laid the groundwork, we now have a strong foundation to believe in the divine nature of God the Father, of Jesus Christ. Christ, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We have a foundation for that. That's not just some random mumbo-jumbo that people came up with back in the early, you know, 300, in the early 2nd century, 3rd century. These aren't just made-up things that people just came up with. That's not what happened. These are truths that we have found in Scripture. And these are truths that have held out throughout the history of the church. And it's so important that we have an understanding. Because I'm telling you, the church, right now, the church is under attack. And I'm not just talking about those who are in the world. I'm 
talking about those who have even been a part of the church. I'm not just talking about those who follow Islam. I'm not just talking about those who are atheists. I'm not just talking about those who are agnostic. I'm talking about those who grew up in church and they didn't have an understanding of what the Bible teaches and they didn't understand how we draw those conclusions. They just simply took it because that's what some preacher in a tie said years ago when they were five. That's what they heard. That's what they always believed. And then when somebody came and said, well, the Bible doesn't say the Trinity, and they said, oh, that's right, the Bible doesn't have the word Trinity. And they didn't understand where we got that idea. It's so important that we have the groundwork laid so that when people come forward about their concerns, when they come forward with their critiques and their criticisms of the Bible, we have a response. And I understand that some of this stuff seems kind of boring and it doesn't seem to really apply. And it doesn't seem like that until you're being questioned and you don't know the answer. It's always easy to kind of feel like this stuff just doesn't matter until it suddenly it becomes ground shaking to you. <coughs> it's when you find yourself in places of doubt that the enemy seeks to attack. And oftentimes it's the smallest thing that shatters our entire faith. Because we don't understand why we believe it. We don't know that it's biblical. We think it's just something that the church has just always believed. And that's the whole point of this series. Is so that we as Christians can understand why we believe what we believe. So that when people come and they ask us, whether it's question us and they just doubt, or whether it's because of their friends who they heard something and they don't know what they believe anymore, we can help lead them in truth. We live in this TikTok theology world where everybody gets these views from social media and from YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and all these people who want to be teachers and they want to tell people or they want to just show why they deconstructed or why they left the faith or they believe that, you know, this is the right, right way to interpret things, and they just seek to teach, and these, these thoughts are invading people's minds. And oftentimes we don't realize it. And if it's not happening to you, it's likely happening to someone that you know. So when they come to you with these questions, when they come to you with these doubts, when they come to you with these accusations, I want you to have a foundation in a response for why you believe what you believe. It's not just for your benefit, and it's not just so that I can practice teaching and see if I know how to communicate things. It's so that those around us can have an understanding of why what we believe, see the love of God in us, and want to be a part of it. And if we can't explain to them what we believe and why we believe it, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to want to be a part of that community. So my prayer for you, as we uh, are talking here, as we uh, look to kind of conclude this sermon. I don't want you to just take my word for it, and I don't want you to just uh, take the word of these like three passages that I pulled out, and you know, I, I don't want that to be the case. My prayer for you is that as we read here, that the things that we believe, I pray that you would bring them in your questions. Not to raise doubt, but so that you can find the answer. My prayer is for us to grow in our faith so that we can communicate that faith to others. Now, uh, if you're following along in the notes portion of the, the Bible app, uh, you'll still see those resources. I'm going to have the resources uh, in that app. I'm going to have that every single week. That's not going to change. Any of those links, 
you can go to, uh, whether it's the Got Questions uh, website, if you go there and you type in Trinity, it's going to pull up why we believe in the Trinity. It's going to show uh, different Bible passages that explain that. If you're looking for more of a book format, uh, if you can go ahead and put those up. The two resources that I have, there are more. Uh, I can put some of these in your hand if you are that interested. Uh, the Portable Seminary, that one, I have that book too. Now, I don't really want to talk with it because you know, it kind of helps me set these bad boys up so I can talk to you about them. But I will. If you want to know more, if you want a better understanding of some of the things that we talk about, if you say, hey, Richard, that book just seems interesting, I'd like to know more, I will put that book in your hand. The Theology from the Great Tradition, I can't quite put that book in your hand. It's, I have it as an e-book. I don't have the hard copy. I guess I could hand you my Kindle or my phone and be like, here you go. Like, I'll need that phone back, though. So I'll show, you, I'll show you the page and be like, here you go, read this page, and I want my phone back. But uh, I want you guys to have resources. That way it's not just like taking my word for it. You can read from all these people with the PhDs, with the big with the big letters at the end of their names, who they do this for a living, they know their stuff, hopefully, um, they will communicate the same stuff that I'm communicating, and they'll hopefully break it down for you so that what I can't do in a 30 minute, hopefully 30 minute, although I haven't kept you guys too long, a 30 minute sermon, what I can't do in that time, they can do on your, on your own time. You can read and get a breakdown of these different beliefs and these ideas. I hope this message hurts. It uh, gives you courage. I hope it encourages you that when people come and they have these attacks, that you are not just dismissed. That you have a response. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word you've given us. God, I thank you for all that you do for us. God, I thank you for your spirit and your son. God, I thank you for their divinity so that our lives could be changed. God, I pray that as we, as we leave from here, as we go out into the world, as we face different people with different beliefs, God, that when they bring some kind of attack, or even if it's not an attack, but just some kind of question, some kind of doubt, God, I pray that you would just give us the wisdom in those situations to point people to your truth. God, I pray that our lives would be a reflection of who you are. God, I thank you for your son who came and died on the cross so that we can be reunited with you. God, I thank you for Spirit who guides us into your truth. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. As for you, uh, this is kind of an invitation. If you have uh, any questions, um, if you have questions, anything that you would like to talk about, uh, any prayers, anything like that, anything you would like to know.